This is Pizzola's motion for a mistrial and a new trial for multiple Brady violations. Now they say that the defendants, the Proud Boys, are now aware of at least some 50 undercover informants among protesters on January 6. But the government is withholding information regarding this exculpatory evidence. The government has the evidence. They know who they are. They know what they were doing. They know who they were working with. The defense says, wait a minute, you're blaming us and our clients for being a part of a massive conspiracy. It sounds like they were a subset of a bigger conspiracy. The federal government had tabs on everything that was going on. And so we may have questions about some of the evidence that the defense sent to these CHSs or these informants because it might prove to exonerate them. But if we don't know who those sources are, then we can't demand and go investigate those texts or those messages in the Telegram groups to exonerate our clients. So they say that now the defense and Dominic Pozzola is now asking the court to order a mistrial and a new trial due to numerous and repeated yet unfolding Brady violations involving CHSs. They say, Judge, Your Honor, the court is already aware that the prosecution in this case has been slow to disclose and turn over exculpatory evidence regarding the scale, the scope, and the nature of the sources within and around the Proud Boys leading up to the events of J6. The FBI had CHSs positioned at the very highest levels of the Proud Boys, including several who were the actual presidents of the Proud Boys chapters. <laughs> the feds had informants who were running entire groups. It's just unbelievable. And then they call them a terroristic organization that is trying to take over the country. It's mostly feds. Now, there were also FBI CHSs within the Ministry of Self-Defense. This is the very chat group that the government claims was the vehicle where they were all conspiring. And this was the mechanism for the mythical Proud Boy plot to overthrow the government. If there had been any actual conspiracy within this chat to violently thwart the transfer of presidency, these informants would have been in a position to alert and inform the authorities of the plot. Why didn't they do this? But now with the trial almost over, it were in day 53 now, and opportunities to examine most government witnesses are all but non-existent, the defense has recently learned, shockingly, that the FBI informants were vastly outnumbered by informants. The defense has learned that FBI informants and CHSs were vastly outnumbered by informants, CHSs, and plain clothes operators representing other law enforcement agencies. A new agency enters the game. They're called Homeland Security Investigations. They played a major role in this. Many handlers, many of them were running CHSs amongst the Proud Boys. Now, there is information here. The defense calls it plainly exculpatory. Body cam videos worn on J6 by undercover Metro PD officers show the undercover officers cheering on demonstrators. The cops are out there in the crowd. They're chanting, go, go, go. They're chanting, stop the thing. They're chanting, whose house? Our house. And the defendants, they say, have a pro se J6 defendant in another case, William Pope, to thank for these revelations. And so shout out to William Pope. It was Pope who apparently found the body camera videos buried amidst the discovery dumps and filed a motion alerting the world. Shout out to William Pope. These videos are published. Now we see undercover operatives who were planted among the protesters as instigators, they say, not just observers. And just this past weekend, over Easter, the defense learned that there were at least 10 to 12 additional previously unknown plainclothes MPD officers among the Proud Boys. This brings the total number of informants among defendants on or around 50 or more. Just by the defense count, it's probably many times more than that. This is what they've been able to identify. These are not confirmed by the government. The government confirmed that there was a list. There's different batches of these, but they're assembling these numbers throughout this trial. This number has not been reported to the jurors, mind you. The government has only stipulated that there were, I think, eight CHSs. 
that the jury will hear about, they're not going to hear about 50 additional informants unless this judge changes course. And there are reasons to suspect the true number is higher. I have no doubt about that. We have Metro PD, we have Homeland Security, we have FBI. I'm sure there are many more within those agencies and there are probably other agencies. The government's response to these late disclosures is to present three Metro PD officers to the defense for interviews. Federal prosecutors selected the three. They picked them. On Friday, April 7th, Metro PD officer Thomas Sula was presented to the defense for an interview. He had a lawyer by his side. And when counsel asked why Thomas Sula's name was not found in the list of 12 undercover MPD electronic surveillance unit officers on January 6th, it was already provided to the defense. Hey, why is your name not in here? Thomas Sula, the prosecutors picked you. Why is your name not in my list? He said, uh, what is this list? And he said, well, they're looking at the list. And your electronic surveillance unit? Yeah, well, he's looking at it. He replied, uh, well, I was not assigned in the same way. And I was not a member of the electronic surveillance unit. And the, the defense, they're sitting there. They're going, well, that's weird. We thought you were somebody who was from this unit. And the government picked you? They say, note that the Metro PD document that was previously provided to the defense in discovery indicated the 12 undercover officers were the total manpower. That's it, right? They have all of the cards in this game. They're supposed to play fair. They're supposed to provide the exculpatory evidence so that the defense can make their case. Otherwise, the defense doesn't have anything. It would be like if you got pulled over and stopped for a DUI and they drew your blood and they said, wow, look at all these drugs in your system. I don't have any drugs in my system. He said, can I see the results? No, he can't show you it. Why not? Sources and methods. What are you, nuts? I can't show you what's in there. Then, we'll, then you'll know how we analyze and test the blood. Sources and methods. Also, we're an FBI agency, don't you know? This is national security, and your DUI was the worst thing that's happened since the Civil War. It's nuts. And when they provide these little bit of uh, drabs of information over to the defense, one of these main claims in this entire case is there's this conspiracy that they're involved in. If there is this conspiracy, then certainly that conspiracy would be known to all of these other confidential human sources, right? That many of them were in the same chats. They would be able to confirm it. Could we know who they are? Bring them on here. Did, did, did you ever hear about any of these insurrection plans? Did you hear about a plan to take over the podium? No? Oh, okay, if you would have, would you have told the FBI about it? Yeah, okay, great. So it didn't exist, right? Yeah, no, not as far as I know, it didn't. Next one, next one, next one, times 50. Would be a great defense, but they're not going to be allowed to do that, I would suspect. But when the government does drip this information out, they say, well, okay, we did have a confidential human source or two, just a couple of them. And here we hand them over and it's just 12 of them. And they say total manpower is 12. Now let's see if we have this exhibit down here at the document, bottom of this document before we come back up here. Yeah, here you go. Here's what they referenced. Metro Police Department Investigative Services Bureau, the Narcotics and Special Investigations Division. This is from New York Avenue, DC. Metro Police. It's a memo to the commander and the Special Operations Division, January 10th, 2021. They say this is a summary of the activity for the electronic surveillance unit. On December 12th through January 6th, very important date right there. The ESU was called upon to assist the SOD. So we have an ESU unit and then we have an SOD to assist the Special Operations Division unit during civil disturbance and First Amendment demos. While assisting with the SOD, members of the ESU captured video and photographic evidence. The total manpower on the ESU team, they say, consisted of 12, two sergeants, three detectives, and seven officers. That's a total of 12, I'm pretty sure about that. Now, here are some more information about all these people. You have their names. It says, Officer Ryan was dispatched here, gonna be taking photographs, he was recording this. They go through all of the names. It's signed off on by Tyrone Harris, the sergeant. And all of these people are listed here. But then when the government prosecutors turn over somebody, actually the witnesses, to be interviewed by the defense, guess what? A new player enters the game. This name is not on that list. Who is this person? Thomas Sula. No, I didn't recognize it from that list. Now, Officer Thomas Sula 
says, no, yeah, I was there and uh, he was a part of it, but his name was not on any of the lists who was previously disclosed. Why not assign the same way? Oh, interesting. That's great. Why weren't you assigned the same way? Was it to keep your name off of a list? Maybe officer Thomasula indicated that he had gone undercover among the protesters on J6. He was a part of the narcotics special investigation division. This was in response to a 1033 code announced by Officer Glover asking everyone to come on J6. Thomas Sula said that he was ordered, had been told to go to the Trump speech on J6 and, quote, blend into the crowd. Oh, like a Trumper. And there were about 10 to 12 others from Thomas Sula's previously not disclosed unit who were there. Uh-oh. So we had a whole list that said total manpower was 12. Turns out it's more like 24. Amazing. Weird. Now, you can see this email they're referencing. It says 10 to 12 others from Thomas Sula who were not there. This is a note that on Friday, April 7th, revelations are in conflict with another email. A prosecutor called Ballantine on April 3rd sent an email to all of the defense lawyers on April 3rd. Dear Mr. Hull and defense lawyers, says, I'm attaching a summary of the Metro PD's ESU deployments, the one that we just saw that was only 12 strong, which I provided you in discovery on Friday. Attaching a summary of what I gave you on Friday. Hmm. Now that sets forth the officers and the members who were conducting plain clothes surveillance. Now he continues, he says, most significantly of all, Thomas Sula, this new officer who appeared out of nowhere, said that his assignment was simply to record evidence on his body cam. That's it. Just go stand around and record evidence. But he said he didn't know if the other 10 to 12, quote, narcotics officers were recording at all. Do they have body cameras? Don't know. Do you know what they were doing? Don't know. Were they doing a similar thing to you? Defendant has not been provided with the body cam footage in any case at all. Now. The defense was asking Thomas Sula, they have a fun time interviewing this guy. They go, well, we don't even know who you are, where you came from, or how you ended up here, but okay. But Thomas Sula said he had destroyed his iPhone and all of his text messages. Interesting. Including, apparently, messages about the Proud Boy structure and the recruitment relating to January 5th and January 6th. Uh, all of that had been auto-deleted, he said. Isn't that nice? Isn't it pretty interesting, huh? So if you're a J6er and you delete anything, they say, you're covering up evidence, aren't you? You're trying to hide material. Why would you delete your messages and leave these groups? You're covering something up like an insurrection, aren't you? We've heard that throughout this entire trial. Oh, and then you deleted it, right? So that's curious. So why are the government agents deleting evidence? Thomas Sula, who was not on the list, who shows up on the case, the defense says, wait a minute, you're with 10 to 12 other people. You're all there. You're all recording body cameras. We don't have any of the body cameras. Neat. So you were there and can we see your cell phone? I mean, did you have any other messages? Because what the defense has just struck is gold. They have this witness that they don't have discovery on and they're going, what the heck else do you have? You have your phone on you? Okay. You have your email account? Do you, uh, is your wife here? Is, uh, who else is here? We're going to get all of it. We want to capture everything. So they start asking him and he says, oh gosh, you know what? Hmm. Strange thing happened. You know, my iPhone. Yeah. And ugh, they're the darndest thing. And all the text messages on there too. Apparently text messages directly related to this case related to the proud boys and recruitment had been auto deleted. Oh man. Government evidence just evaporates. Thomas Sula said that there were meetings before being deployed, but the defense counsel has no reports whatsoever of those meetings. Hmm. And it's interesting because the government is trying to prove that there's a conspiracy to insurrect the country. And one key defense might be that maybe there was an exacerbation of this entire ordeal by the federal agents. And you're allowed to make that defense. And it certainly looks like that by the numbers. And if there is a defense to this stuff, it's that there was no intent to do a conspiracy anyways, and that the defense would be proven by showing that all of the conversations with all of the FBI informants show that there is no indicia of a conspiracy. You don't have to prove that the FBI was conspiring to create January 6th to create a defense for the Proud Boys to show they didn't have intent to just meet the checkboxes. 
It doesn't have to be this massive counter conspiracy. There's just not enough evidence in this case if only the jurors could hear it. And he admitted that he himself had been heard on the video. Tomalusa himself is screaming on the camera, whose house, our house. And he's saying, stop the thing. Defense writes again, this content would have been absolutely exculpatory if it had been timely provided to the defense. If we were able to see this, we could have plastered this all over the cameras for the jurors to see that the cops were the ones who were initiating this. Thomas Sula indicated that he would have, did you write any reports about this officer? Well, I would have, I would have immediately written reports of any violence or, or violent talk or any violent insurrectionist plans among the proud boys, but I reported none. He says, actually, I would have, I didn't, I didn't in this case, if they would have been insurrecting America, I would have reported about it, but I didn't have any indication of that. So such information says the defense would have been nice to have weeks ago when the defendants were cross-examining government witnesses and developing their defenses. The trial is now likely in its final week. So the government was able to keep the lid on this thing until the very end, right? Just get it through, just ram it in there. Doesn't matter. Just shove her in there and shut the door. She'll fit. And not only were these undercover MPD officers watching the activities of the crowd, but they also, according to the defense team says they incited the crowds into acts of violence and into acts of open conflict as the crowd approached the building. And we covered that previously where the police officers are calling out people in the crowd, gray hair and cops are on camera firing and then saying, boom, got him. Boom, boom, got him. We still do not know the extent to which the crowd's First Amendment demonstrations were transformed into violence by undercover law enforcement officers. And the Tomalusa body cam video may just be the tip of a much larger iceberg. So the defense says Pozzola, accordingly, is entitled to a new trial so that he can subpoena all of these witnesses, have these witnesses identify each other in the videos in the crowds, and identify whether there are other Metro officers wearing GoPro or body cameras that day. And if there are other 10 to 12 other narcotics, quote, special investigative division undercovers, or any of the other 40 plus CHSs belonging to any one of these agencies, the FBI, the Metro, Homeland Security, if they're filming, if they're reporting or recording, the defense is entitled to this evidence. Pozzola reserves the right to demand a dismissal for Brady violations based upon this outrageous government conduct for not disclosing this evidence. Now, the defense continues. They tell us that the government prosecutors here have unlawfully held exculpatory evidence stemming from all agencies other than the FBI. Prosecutors here have been saying that the defense is only entitled to FBI materials. Right. They have access to the entire government, but there are limitations on what the government has to go and get. If you're a defendant and you're asking the prosecutor to turn over discovery information about some abstract, the Department of Agriculture case or something, right, something very far unrelated, the judge will say they've got no obligation to go get that for you. OK, go get it yourself. But in this criminal case, the government is using that argument and they're trying to put a force field, a hula hoop, as we say, to contain the scope of this case from going outside and beyond the FBI, because they know that if that happens, well, the floodgates are going to be open. Pandora's box will be revealed and we'll see there are feds all over this case. So they want that to be buried, limit it to the FBI, say, oh, no, no, no. I mean, they're all irrelevant. Homeland Security was focused on foreign threats or uh, Metro PD was focused on, you know, littering or uh, misdemeanors. And this is a felony and this is sedition. And so it's all irrelevant. The defense is not entitled to it. The defense is saying, yes, we are. If there were 50 informants embedded in the context of the events right around our clients, we need to know about that. This past week is outlined, undersigned counsel consulted with the ranking U.S. attorney. So the defense attorney met with the government and was informed by her that the government is considering its Brady obligations only for the FBI. So the defense is not entitled to any evidence according to the government, from confidential human sources, from HSI, from Metro PD, anybody else, even though they may be very well a part of the story. Remember, they're charging Enrique Tario with crimes. He wasn't even there on the day of January 6th. So you see how far the tentacles will be allowed to go for the defense, not so for the government. Now, this means that across the board, all topics for all J6 defendants 
The defense says the government has been systematically violating Brady. And this is not a question of the defendant's suspicions or their inferences or their conclusions. This is from their statements. They said in an email on April 4th, Ballantyne, U.S. prosecutor, responded to the lawyer's email. They say, Mr. Roots. That's how they sound in their emails. I don't know whether so-and-so or Jeremy Brown are sources for another agency. I don't know. They might work for HSI or they might work for Metro PD. I don't care. But even if they were, I don't see how that fact would even be relevant here because she's a prosecutor. She has no idea. Homeland Security, she says, I'm not even sure whatever that would be. It's not the investigative agency in this case. It's not relevant here. What is the relevance of that person's name if they're related to another agency? And of course, the answer is, well, they might have information that's exculpatory to our clients. That's in possession of the government. You may not think it's relevant to the case because you only want to keep this contained to the FBI, but that's not reality, right? The defense is allowed to know about these things and then we can make the argument to the court. You don't get to tell us that there is just a whole batch of information that's not accessible to us because you have deemed it's not relevant. We'll be the ones who get to deem whether it's relevant. We'd like a full list and we'd like to go into the judge and say, judge, yes, there are 50 people. We want all of them. The government says eight are relevant to us. We say it should be a hundred. The judge can split it and say, all right, well, here's 25. But that's the judge's decision, not the government's decision. The defense says this is not the law. And this is also not true. And this, they say, cannot be salvaged. This case is too far gone. If the U.S. Attorney's Office for D.C. has been operating under the rule that only FBI documents need to be screened for disclosure under Brady, then the constitutional rights of our clients have been dumped on. Our co-defendants and everything have been violated, and this criminal prosecution must be dismissed. And if you don't do that, you got to order a new trial. Now, while Brady obligations don't extend to the entirety of the government, but they do extend to the investigative agencies, right? That's kind of, that was my agriculture analogy. There is limitations to this, but if the agencies were investigating J6 and they were standing there at the same scene, aren't they relevant? Because they are investigating in a law enforcement manner. Agencies related or who knew or who should have known that this would have been related to this case. They say here in the U.S. Capitol, the police are directly related and fully aware of the events on J6. Capitol Police is an agency of Congress, and Congress are the two primary alleged victims here. And so its immediacy to events and its geographic proximity, everybody is in close proximity to here. It's all relevant. Now, the defense says this is not the first warning that the government is systematically under disclosing information under Brady. They're artificially limiting disclosures and they're only releasing certain materials that they think were possessed by the FBI. What about all of the other footage from everything else? They say that most of the witnesses from the FBI have no firsthand knowledge of the events and they're just reporting and regurgitating reports, mostly from Capitol Police officers says most FBI agents are not even investigating January 6th reports, but they're only sitting at desks reading reports from those who did investigate. Now he writes about what Brady material requires and he gives us some case law, says that disclosure affects not only the prosecutor, but also the government, including its agencies. If a prosecutor just is only limited to giving you what they can be bothered to find, well, yeah, that's a lot of work. That's in the DHS building and that's in the MPD building. My office is here, FBI is right there. I'll go to the FBI, but the other stuff, I just don't think it's relevant or necessary. It's a lot of work. Well, it's an investigative agency that is directly related to the criminal prosecution of a group of defendants. It's relevant. So here, the defense continues. They say, we suspect that there is much more evidence of collusion between law enforcement agencies regarding these informants. Confidential sources and plain clothed agents among protesters that have not been disclosed. They say, for example, here's a couple ideas that we have covered. One, there is a joint terrorism task force involving multiple agencies that almost certainly facilitated integration between other agencies. A big group of people working on that day. And you may see this in your local towns. Here in Arizona, we have the East Valley Task Force that comes out every time there is a holiday. And it's a group of police. They all get activated and they go cite a bunch of people for tickets and DUIs. So similar thing here. How many of those people were undercover? There was also the U.S. Parks Counterterrorism Unit. 
how many people were embedded there. They had their own protocols. They had a uniform presence, according to the defense, and they were there every 15 minutes on patrol. We have another one. There was a Fort Myer counterterrorism unit that was there. How many people on that one? Another counterterrorism unit, primarily used for air defense. They were driving Patriot battery into the streets of D.C., more feds. And there are other federal agencies which are notorious for implanting and embedding informants among dissident groups, like the BATFE, DEA. No information about any of those agencies. So if you add them all up, how many are there really? In totality, Pozzola demands a declaration of a mistrial, demands a new trial, says the United States is not obliged to their obligations under Brady, and therefore this case should be dismissed. You see the certificate of service sent over to the U.S. Attorney's Office asking for a dismissal of the charges. And every day we see a new filing here. There are more and more confidential human sources that are being discovered by the defense. Whatever the total number will be is yet to be seen. We'll see what the judge says about this. The government will, of course, respond and we'll see what they say and how the judge rules. Now, there was another interesting motion that I want to just briefly touch on. This was the discussion about bringing in an expert to discuss window damage. So this was an eight-page filing. And one of the things that you often neglect in a criminal case are damages. You're often thinking about the the action. What was the thing that happened? Like the damage, the punch, the DUI, whatever it is. But often in one of the elements of crime, one element of crimes can often be, you got to meet a certain threshold in value. In other words, if it's over $1,000 of damage, it's a felony. If it's under $1,000 of damage, it's a misdemeanor. If it's over 2,000, it's a worse felony than if it's $1,000, right? Many statutes are structured this way. And so the defense wants to bring in somebody to analyze the glass because one of the indictment charges is saying that Dominic Pozzola broke some glass. And so the defense says, not so fast there, buddy boy. They want to bring in this guy called Duffy Hoffman, one of the most amazing window replacement and valuation experts of historic buildings. He's replaced over 20,000 panes of glass at various projects at homes on Capitol Hill and elsewhere. And he's going to come in here and he's going to testify about the national standards for billing and for valuation about the window that was described in count seven of Mr. Pozzola's charges. He's going to testify that under no normal conventional or recognized injury standard, could the damage to the window be as valued as high as $1,000 or more? And he's like, that's ridiculous. A thousand bucks. He's like, I can, I could fix that for a hundred dollars. Give me a hammer and a screwdriver. (laughs) <laughs> He's no problem. Mr. Hoffman is also going to testify, but it's the government, of course. So that same hammer, that set of screws, you know, for them, it's going to be, I don't know, 1.5 million, probably, probably need to ship it over to Ukraine first and make sure they can look at it and send it back or whatever they're doing with that money. Mr. Hoffman will also testify regarding the inadequacy of the invoicing and the billing that have occurred thus far in trial. Now they've notified the defense about this. They say this person is absolutely needed to come in on direct exam. They're talking about the the costs of this. They say this misled a jury. The window is not a high price window and the valuation is improper. And so the jury should be allowed to hear this witness and please let our expert come in and testify for the defense. And here's a little bit more about him. Sounds like an amazing dude. Duffy Hoffman preservation specialist for historic structures. It's not even a big deal. All right, so all of these numbers that they're also talking about, millions of dollars of damage. This guy's like, no, no, look at this, all this experience. I'll, I'll fix it in no time. I'm fixed in a weekend. Not even a big deal. Relax. That is from another expert witness. All of that in the Dominic Pozzola efforts as day 53 of the Proud Boys trial continues. Mm-hmm.